Glory to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight because we've been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in that army of the Lord. Hallelujah. Nothing can stop this mighty moving force. Glory to God. We thank you tonight for your great plan of redemption that you planned and sent the Lord Jesus Christ to carry out, to consummate. Thank you that we're privileged to walk in the light of that redemption tonight. Thank you again for your precious, holy, written word. Thank you for your, the great, mighty Holy Spirit whom you've sent to indwell us, to be our teacher, to be our guide. We trust him tonight to live big in us, to think through our minds, to speak through our lips, to unveil the word of God unto our spirits. And we pray for all of us that we shall not just be hearers of the word only, but that we shall be doers thereof. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. You may be seated. I'll invite you again tonight to open your Bibles to the same scripture we looked at last night to begin with. Ephesians chapter 1 and Ephesians chapter 3. We shall begin to read with the 16th verse of Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul writing to the church at Ephesus said that I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that's named, not only in this world but also in that which is to come and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church which is his body the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now that's the end of the first chapter. You understand, of course, that Paul did not write a letter to the church at Ephesus in chapter and verses. Man divided it in chapter and verses for reference sake. But as we continue to read, he's still following the same theme, what he was talking about, the revelation that he wanted them to get. Let's, let's read a few verses of the first, uh, uh, of the second chapter. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in times past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation, manner of life or conduct, in times past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. Jesus. Then we have a prayer in the third chapter of Ephesians that Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. Let's begin with the uh, 14th verse. For which cause, for this cause, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints 
what is the breadth and length and depth and height and to know the love of Christ with passeth knowledge that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Then another verse, Luke the 10th chapter and the 19th verse. Behold, I give unto you power or authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Hallelujah. Amen. Now really to get the most out of this message tonight, you should have heard the message that went forth last night. And if you didn't hear it, I would encourage you to get the tape. But now notice this, that there are two key phrases in the prayer which Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus, as is recorded in this first and second chapter of Ephesians. Notice the expression in Ephesians 1.20, and set him, talking about Jesus, at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now notice in the second chapter, the sixth verse, and has raised us up together. We're talking about the authority of the believer in the mind of God the Father and in the mind of the Lord Jesus Christ, we were raised when Christ was raised. Now notice also that he said in that sixth verse of that second chapter that he not only raised us up together, but he made us sit together Amen. in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So in the mind of God, we were raised when Christ was raised, and when Christ sat down, we sat down too. Now that's where we are now. I said, that's where we are now. In the, we need to know that. We need to realize that now, now, we're sitting with him with all of the authority that's given unto him, and that authority belongs to us. We exercise the authority that was given to him because it belongs to us through him. You'll notice it said in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. We help him by carrying out his work upon the earth. Not only have we been made to sit, but also notice where we are sitting. Notice the 21st verse says we are sitting far above all principality and power and might and dominion. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. Now you remember in Ephesians the 6th chapter and the 12th verse, it said, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But remember that we're sitting above them Amen. with Christ. Hallelujah. Not only is Christ seated at the right hand of the Father far above all of these powers, but we're there too. It said, he hath made us sit together. Glory to God. Amen. Now the word of God tells us to conquer the devil. Amen. We have the authority to do it. Can you say amen? amen? I remember 1952, I was holding a revival meeting here in the state of Oklahoma. And 
during that uh, meeting, the Lord appeared to me in a vision. That was the second time that he, well, really the third time that he appeared to me. First in 1950, and through 1950 through 1959, the Lord Jesus appeared to me eight different times. And uh, three times out of the eight talked to me for an hour and a half. And this was one of those times. I'll not go into all of it, but there's something here I want you to get. He appeared to me in this vision, spoke to me, and right at the end of the vision, he was talking to me about the devil, demons, and demon activity and how to exercise authority over them. And right at the end of the vision, he seemed to be standing up about where the ceiling of the room was, and I was kneeling there before him. And, and so here came a demon or an evil spirit between the two of us and put out something like a smoke screen or a dark cloud, and I couldn't see Jesus anymore. And then that demon just jumped up and down. It looked a whole lot like a little monkey. When I say little monkey, I don't mean exactly, but I mean about that size and sort of monkey-like. Face was different, but body was sort of like a little monkey. And, and he jumped up and down and, and waved his arms and his legs, kicked his legs, and in a real shrill-like voice said, yakety yak yak yakety yak yak just to thrill like a whistle almost and pierce your ears. I couldn't hear one word that Jesus was saying, and I couldn't see him because of the dark cloud. And, and, and I wondered, you know, just in a few seconds, I wondered, well, now, why did the Lord permit that? Why, why did he let that happen? I, I needed to hear what he was saying, and, and I'm not hearing what he's saying. Don't he know that I'm not hearing what he's saying? Why don't he tell that demon to stop? Why don't he rebuke that demon? Why don't he make him stop? Those thoughts are going through my mind. That's what I'm thinking. But the dark cloud's still there. I can't see Jesus. I can't hear a word he's saying. And yet I hear the sound of his voice, but I can't distinguish any words. And so I almost panicked, you know. I thought I need to hear that. And so suddenly, just without thinking, I just suddenly said, spoke to the Spirit. And I said, I command you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to shut up and to stop. Now, when I said that, I mean, he just hit the floor kerflop. The cloud disappeared, and I could see Jesus standing there then. And, and that little demon just lay there on the floor and whimpered and whined and shook like a little pup that you'd whipped, you know. And then Jesus said something that absolutely upended my theology. <laughs> I mean, it was different than anything. Sometimes our theology needs to be upended. Yes. Say what you want to, it's absolutely true. Yes. Jesus pointed to that spirit lying there in the floor, a whimpering and a whining and a shaking like he's afraid, pointed to him and said, if you hadn't done something about that, I couldn't. And I remember I got a hold of my ear and shook it. I said, Lord, you know, I, I didn't hear right. Now, I know that you didn't say that if I hadn't done something about that uh, demon, you couldn't. You said you wouldn't, didn't you? He said, I said, if you hadn't done something about that demon or evil spirit, I couldn't. I said, there's something wrong with my hearing. I, I'm not a hearing right. Now, you didn't say, if I hadn't done something about that spirit, demon spirit, you couldn't, you said you wouldn't, didn't you? No, he said and spoke real, I mean firm and stern like. You know, he can get stern. I, I, I don't imagine he looked too happy, you know, when he took that whip and drove those money chambers, changes out of the temple. I imagine he looked pretty stern, wouldn't you think so? And I mean, he got real stern with me. <laughs> and, and, and he looked at me very sternly and said, No, I said I could. Now I said, Lord, that's, uh, that's just different than anything I've ever heard. <laughs> that's different than anything I've ever preached myself. I said, I, I can't accept that. I don't care if I am seeing you and hearing you talk to me. I'll not accept any vision, any kind of experience if it can't be proven by the written word. 
And I said, I can't accept that unless you give me at least three references. But, and all of them in the New Testament because we're living in the New Testament. Because I said, the Bible said, in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So you're going to have to give me at least three references in the New Testament for me to accept it. You think he got angry with me? He smiled then so sweetly and said, I'll do you one better. I'll give you four. <laughs> well, I said, I've read the New Testament through 150 times. And if there's anything like that in there, I don't know it. He said, why, son, there's a lot in there you don't know yet. <laughs> I'm so glad there is. Amen. 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 Praise God. And so Jesus proceeded to get me further in hot water before he got me out. You know, he'll do that sometimes. Amen. Amen. You see, friend, what happens with us is that a lot of time people try to figure things out in their head, but we've got to get the revelation of what God's saying in our spirits, in our hearts, on the inside of us. So then Jesus went on and said to me, there is no place in the New Testament anywhere where any writer, that is any of those that wrote a letter to the churches, Paul, James, John, Peter, Jude, any of them that wrote a letter to the churches, he said there's no place in the New Testament where any writer told the church to pray to God the Father about the devil or prayed, told the church to pray to the God the the Father to do anything about the devil or prayed that God would rebuke the devil. And he said to pray to me, Jesus Christ, or to God the Father to rebuke the devil is to waste your time. I said, dear Lord, I've wasted a lot of time. Because I guess we all have. Amen, before the revelation came. I've said I've wasted a lot of time. See, people who ask God to rebuke the devil are wasting their time. That's what he told me. You see, now why? The least member of the body of Christ has just as much power over the devil as anyone else. Amen. Now, see, a lot of times people would think, well, now Paul's apostle. He's got power over the devil. Somebody specially called of God has got authority over the devil, but not me. No, the least member in the body of Christ has just as much authority over the devil as anyone else. Amen. 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 And unless believers do something about the devil, nothing will be done. Amen. Now then, here's the scripture. Turn to Matthew. First scripture Jesus gave me. Matthew records that Christ said, when he arose from the dead, all power, King James, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth. And Jesus in talking to me said, you know, you've looked the word up in the Greek concordance. That word, the Greek word also means authority and it can be translated that way. All authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. And he said to me, if you stop reading right there, Jesus said, you would say, well, dear Lord Jesus, you do have authority on the earth. But he said, I immediately delegated the authority in the earth to the church. I immediately said, go. Isn't that the next word? Isn't that the next word? See, he's the head, we're the body. Because he is the head, because he is victorious, because he won the victory over the devil, hallelujah, he's authorizing us, go with my authority. Now then, then, he, then he referred to Mark. You remember Mark's gospel is a little more explicit. Mark the 16th chapter, go. There the word go is again. Go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be down, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils, they'll speak with new tongues, and so on. Now, the very first sign that was to follow any believer was, in my name, they'll cast out devils. Any believer. Amen. 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 These signs shall follow them that believe. Actually, the Greek Testament's a little more explicit. It said, these signs shall follow the believing ones. Now, he's just simply saying that believers will have authority over the devil. 
In fact, that's the way Jesus interpreted that scripture to me. Instead of reading it like the King James, where it says, in my name they'll cast out devil, he said, the very first sign was that in my name the believer will exercise authority over the devil. Well, you'd have to exercise authority over him. You couldn't cast any out, could you? Amen? Amen. In other words, they'll break the power of the devil. You've got that authority to do it over your own life and over the life of your loved one. Now, you can't go down the street just breaking the power of the devil over everybody because they got a will of their own. We'll get to that later on. You've got authority over evil spirits, but not human spirits. So, they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll lay hands on the sick. They shall recover. Notice each time it said they'll do it. Now, it doesn't say that Jesus will lay hands on the sick. It says that you do it. You lay hands on the sick. If you lay hands on the sick, you're exercising authority over the devil and over sickness. It's you that does it. Now then, here's another verse he gave me, James, the fourth chapter and the seventh verse. James is writing to the church, isn't he? Amen. We notice there in the fifth chapter, in the 14th verse, 15th verses, he said, is any sick among you? I'm called for the elders of the church. See the word church there. So he said in James 4, 7, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You is the understood subject of the sentence. James did not say, pray to God so that he, God, will resist the devil for you. James said, you resist the devil. Well, you would have to, to have authority over him to be able to do it, wouldn't you? See, you're supposed to resist the devil. Did you ever stop thinking about it? No Christian is supposed to get anybody else to do anything about the devil for them. I don't sit out there and look at me in that tone of voice and tell you the truth. I said no Christian is supposed to get anybody else or a fellow Christian to do something about the devil in their final and last analysis. Nobody can anyway. They might help you temporarily. You're going to have to learn to exercise your own authority. Are you listening to me? Now notice what it said. You, you is the understood subject of the sentence. I'd read and I put you in there. You resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Amen? Amen? Now, it doesn't say that he'll flee from Jesus. It said he'll flee from you. See, the authority is yours. Well, somebody said, I, I, I just don't feel like it. The feeling hadn't got anything to do with it. Amen. That authority is yours whether you feel like it or not. But you must exercise it. Last night we were talking about a policeman exercising authority. He's standing out in the middle of the street directing traffic. He holds up his hand and stops the traffic from flowing this away and everybody stops. I've been there. I stopped, didn't you? Well, he's exercising authority that's invested in him. He don't have the strength or the power to stop all those cars. They can run over him. But he's got authority. You know, the devil recognizes authority. Amen. Absolutely. And, and so that policeman just hold up his hand. The traffic all stops because he's authorized to do that. Well, he might not feel like doing it, but the authority works whether he feels like it or not. And that's where a lot of Christians miss it because they're going by feelings. Their fate's not in their authority. Their fate's in their feelings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? Well, I knew some way or another after that uh, vision, my spirit told me that there was a, a significance in that word flee, F-L-W, flee. And I knew the meaning of the word in general. But I looked it up in the dictionary, one of these big thick ones, you know, about a foot thick, you know. <laughs> and, and, and there were several pages on that. They even went to the scripture and used these scriptures. And I found a definition that I like because it, it just described what I saw. It said to flee from means to run from as in terror. To run from as in terror. Resist the devil and he'll run from you as in terror. Amen. I said amen. Now most Christians don't know that. They, they, they see the devil, they run from him as in terror. 
but he's supposed to be running from them. So then when I found that definition, then I knew why the demon, that evil spirit in my vision, had begun to whimper and cry and tremble and shake. He is scared. Amen. Amen. Because he knows that he's a defeated foe and he knows now I've found out about it. Now then here's another scripture. See, that's three. Now here's four. Or this is the fourth one. Actually, we put the two together, Matthew and, and Mark. Now, 1 Peter 5, 8. See, every single writer in the New Testament, writing to Christians, writing to believers, every single time he tells them to do something about the devil. Well, you have to have authority. You couldn't do it, could you? All right, notice what it said, 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, yeah, we have an adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, your adversary means your opponent. Adversary means your opponent, your enemy. It means one arrayed against you. It's the enemy, Satan. The problem with a lot of Christians is they say, oh, the devil's after me. Let's pray. Y'all pray for me so the devil won't get me. Well, the devil's already got him. <laughs> Tell you the real truth about the matter. If you talk that like that, you're already got it. You know what I mean by that expression. Now, you can turn in prayer requests. You can get all the preachers on the radio and television, half their wives to pray for you but you'll still be bound because you're not doing anything. Amen. Amen. We might as well face up to it. We have to do something about it. We are told to do something about it. So that's the picture. First of all, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now what are you going to do about it? Stick your head in the sand like an ostrich and maybe you'll go away. Encourage one another with natural human sympathy. Well, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. It's a mighty long road that doesn't turn. Everything will be better tomorrow. No, bless God, go ahead and do what the Bible said do. Read the next verse. Whom resist? That's what you're supposed to do. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions, the word afflictions mean tests and trials, same test, same trial, are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Now the American Revised Version reads, instead of reading whom resist steadfast in the faith, resist reads whom resist steadfast in your faith. I like that. Amen. Now, I remember that Jesus said to me, Peter, writing this letter to believers, he said, if it had been like folks are today, I'm, I'm quoting Jesus verbatim. He said, if it's like things were in 1952, and, and, and we could say today too, Peter would have wrote a letter to these Christians and said, it's come to my knowledge that God's using our beloved brother, Apostle Paul, in a special way so that handkerchiefs or aprons are being taken from his body unto the sick and those that have spirits and demons, and the diseases leave them, the evil spirits depart from them. So I suggest you send to Paul for one of those handkerchiefs. Come on now, don't shout me down because I'm preaching real good. That's what Jesus said to me. But no, he said, Peter said, you resist the devil. You don't have to send to Brother Paul. God is using Paul. But all those devils and sickness and disease that were leaving those people were not Christian people. Go back to the, to the 19th chapter of Acts. He was preaching there in Ephesus. These people were not Christian people. Are you listening to me? Every believer has the same authority Paul had in Christ Jesus. 
Did you hear me? Every believer has the same authority that Peter had. That's the reason he didn't say, well, send your request in to me and I'll handle it for you. No, he went ahead and told him what to do. You resist the devil. Amen. Amen. But you know we're great getting wanting somebody else. Wanting somebody else to do it for me. A lady said to me, I mean a man said to me, bought his wife. He said, my wife is hearing voices. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> I ain't going to do nothing about it. What's she going to do about it? Right. I was holding a meeting in the state of Oregon a number of years ago. To be more explicit, in the year of 1956, <laughs> and I started the meeting off, and a smaller church, wasn't a real large church, a few hundred. I guess the auditorium would seat four or five hundred people. And so I'd just have a healing service, lay hands on people twice a week. And so this man brought his wife up in the line. I didn't know him because I'm a stranger. I know the pastor. He came from Oklahoma. My wife and I stand in the parsonage with him. So when I got to this lady, you could tell by looking at her, her mind's not right, her eyes don't look right. And so, and her husband's along with her, holding her by the arm. When they, I took them one by one, talked to them, find out what's wrong with them. So when they got up to me, I said, well, uh, what did you come for? He did all the talking. He said, she came for healing. He said, she's been two years over in the state institution. We used to call them insane asylums. And that sounds nicer to say state institution, you know. She's been there two years, and uh, so they dismissed her and let her come home. She's been home about six months, but she's getting back. Well, in fact, he said they're going to take her back again. So I want you to pray for her. Well, I laid hands on her and started to pray, and when I did, I had a revelation. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. And so I said to the pastor, he's standing right beside me, can we use your office or pastor study? In fact, it was just, uh, you come right out of that and walk up on the platform. I said, and, and, and the pastor spoke up and said, yes, said this man's a deacon here in our church. I said, well, you take your wife there, and I'll come there when, when I get through here and talk to you. And so we, uh, we uh, went ahead with the healing line and finished it. And then I said to the pastor, you come and go with me. And he told me this is a deacon. His wife used to be a Sunday school teacher here before she lost her mind. You say, a uh, 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 born again, spirit filled Sunday school teacher can lose their mind, go to this island? Well, emphatically, yes, she had, hadn't it? So we got in there and we sat down and I said to him and to her, she's sitting there, I said, now, I'll tell you why. I didn't want to talk out there in front. Uh, you, you, you can't say a lot of things. You shouldn't say. And anybody that does say a lot of things out in front about people, concerning people in, 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 in a crowd, when a lot of folks are there, uh, they're nuts. They're stupid. Some things need to be dealt with privately. Are you listening to me? I said, are you listening to me? Amen. Holy Ghost is not going to embarrass anybody. Right. He won't embarrass you. So I said, now the reason that I did minister to her is because when I touched her, and I don't know why it works that way sometimes, but sometimes it does, I, I, I knew all about the case. You hadn't told me anything except she'd been two years in this island. I said, now let me tell you, if I miss it, you speak up and tell me you missed it. I said, now, this woman... See, we're talking about, about the 50s now. Brother Oral Roberts was holding a meeting over here at Portland, and y'all went over there to a meeting, and she heard him say that God spoke to him in Enid, Oklahoma, 1947, in an audible voice. But remember, he wasn't seeking an audible voice. If God wanted to speak that way, he could. Several times he's spoken to me that way. I, I, I suppose, I was by myself, I guess it's audible, it sounded that way to me. But I said, then she began to seek voices. It's unscriptural to seek voices because you've departed from the word of God and the, and the devil will accommodate it. So she began to hear these voices and they drove her crazy. So then you took her to Robert's meeting because he's still in those tent meetings, you know, in those days in the 50s. You took her to Robert's meetings and he didn't deliver, so you're mad at him. Then you took her to Brother Branham, came over here to, to Salem, Oregon. 
I only knew that by revelation. I didn't know otherwise it was there. He, I said, you took her to Brother Branham's meeting, and Brother Branham didn't deliver her, and you got mad at him. And if I endeavored to minister to him, I couldn't deliver her, and then you'd be mad at me. Because I said, you see, she's got enough intelligence. She knows exactly what I'm saying. And then I looked at her and I said, you understand everything I'm saying, don't you? She said, sure I do. Yeah, I understand everything you were saying. I said, you see, as long as you want to hear those voices, you're going to hear them. But now if you don't want to hear them, I can help you. See, you can't get people delivered that don't want to be delivered. Anymore you can get people saved that don't want to be saved. Amen? Amen? And you can't get people healed that don't want to be healed. Are you listening to me? As long as you want it that way, it's going to be that way. And she just spoke up and said, well, I want it that way. I said, I knew you wanted it that way. That's the reason I didn't minister to the case. Because it's going to stay that way as long as you want it that way. But now if you don't want to be free, you just let me know and we'll be able to help you. See, we can exercise authority. Amen, over the devil and demons. But you have something to do. And you need to take your place. Amen. Amen. And so then a lot of folks are always asking why they don't get healed or why they don't get delivered from this or that and the other. Something's wrong. They have ministers to pray for them. Nothing happens. People suggest sometimes that the minister, the pastor, can't pray the prayer of faith anymore. But are you taking your place? Now you understand this, when people first get saved, they're baby Christians, and right at first God will allow other people to carry them for a little while. But the time will come that he's going to say, you put that big young and down, let him walk. Yeah. And if people haven't been taught correctly, then they're going to have a big cry on their hands. One time my wife and I was attending a local sectional convention. We stayed in the home of uh, some young people, and actually... Before she married, the young lady was a member of our church. And they said to us one day when we got up and started to the convention, they just had a young baby a few months old. This baby had a rupture. And they said, Brother Hagin, uh, would you pray? You're an, an, an old Ethan. So we prayed. The rupture disappeared. The child was healed. And I remember that she said to me, Brother Hagin, it seems as if the older people, the older saints, they, they don't ever get any results anymore. That's the reason I didn't go to them. In fact, I guess everybody in the church prayed for the child. The pastor had prayed for the child. Uh, we younger folks, there's only one that's ever seemed to get any healing. Now, it ought to be the other way around. People should have grown in faith and should have developed their faith. But what happened was they just sat around and didn't try to develop anything. Are oh, you listening? And, and they just thought somebody else can carry me on their faith. No, the time will come when you'll have to exercise authority for yourself. Amen. You'll have to know what belongs to you. You'll have to walk in the light of that which is yours. But you see, if you haven't had right teaching, you've continued for years sometime in a babyhood state of development, never attempted to exercise faith on your own, just depended on somebody else's faith and prayer, the time's coming that their faith and prayer won't work anymore. Many people here in this church have heard Ken talk about it. when he was 15 years old, had an infection in his ear. Well, he'd always just call daddy, I mean, when he's 12 years old. But his, his mother was with me and, and, and their grandmother was with them. And she called and said, son, what know, uh, to call me and said, what am I going to do with this boy? I said, what's the matter with him? Well, he come in from school, everybody up here has got the mumps. He came in from school, his jaws all swelled up and said he'd just been a crying. Ever since he came in from school, tried to get me to call. She didn't want to call, run up the telephone bell. He said later, finally when she put him on, he said, Daddy, I know that's the only way I can get Grandma to call. If I just keep crying long enough, she'd eventually give in. And said, I told Grandma, I told Grandma, there's no use of me missing school. Just call Daddy and have him to pray and I'll be all right. So I prayed and 40, 45 minutes, a month is gone. He's never had him that day to this. Amen. Amen. He's 12. Now he's 15. But he's got this ear infection. His ears are hurting him. Kept hurting him. I prayed for him just like I did otherwise. He even come back by and laid hands on him. Still didn't work. So had to take him to the doctor. Clean the fungus out of his ear. 
Doctor said this is a South Sea fungus. Some of the GIs have brought it back over here from the South Seas. It's incurable. Now, if you could live in Arizona, New Mexico, somewhere where it's dry, you might get by with just cleaning the fungus out of the air about every three months. Don't go in swimming anymore. Don't go uh, stay out of water because the more water you're around, the more wet it is, well, the more it grows. And time you get to be 40 years old, well, you'll probably lose hair in that ear, you know, and it'll all be gone. I mean, the ear will just be of no use to you. And there's nothing we can do about it, nothing medical science can do. So I'm away up in Pennsylvania preaching, and I went to the Lord about it. And the Lord said to me, no, your faith can't work for him anymore. You've carried it for 15 years on your faith. But it won't work for him anymore. Because, see, he's heard you preach faith and healing all of his life. I expect him to walk in the light of what he knows. Not only that, he's heard you so much, he can preach some of your sermons and messages as good as you can. Amen. So I got home the very next day, Christmas time. They all had to take him to the doctor to clean the fungus out of his ear. On the way back, I said, son, this is the first time in over 15 years, actually 15 years and four months, you've failed to receive healing. He said, yeah, that's right. I said, you know why? He said, no. I began to tell him what the Lord said. When I got down to the place, I said, you thought all I got to do is just get daddy to pray. How brother would the pastor to anoint him with oil? That'll work. Yeah, sometimes it will, sometimes it won't. Are you listening to me? I said, you didn't try to exercise any faith yourself. No, you were just depending on us to do it. When I got down to the place where I said, the Lord said, you can preach some of my sermons as good as I, I can, he said, yeah, I've been doing it. He's speaking to some of the young people, <laughs> using some of my outlines. <laughs> Amen. So we got to the house about then, walked into the living room. I said, well, <clears throat> now, what are you going to do about it? See, we want somebody else to do it. But he's got authority. Now then, he's old enough to recognize that authority. And he's going to have to walk in that authority if he gets results. And so I said to him, you want to go through life and never go swimming anymore? Doctor said, stay away from water. You want to lose your hearing in that ear? No. Doctor said, it's incurable. Well, I said, you know how to pray? He said, yeah. You know how to believe God? He said, yeah. I said, let's get down here and do it then. So we got on our knees, two large chairs in the living room. He kept looking at me. I said, I'm not going to pray a lick. <laughs> I'm not going to pray a lick. You know what I mean by that? Not one prayer. All I'm going to do is scotch for you. You do your prayer and I'll say amen. <laughs> so to make a long story short, he did his prayer and got healed. Amen. amen. His ear is all right today. Amen. And he's two or three days past 40 and still got his hearing. <laughs> in fact, when he was in the army, you know, because he's in the intelligence and communication, you've got to take a hearing test, you see, to be able to hear what's transmitted. And that ear is stronger than the other, if I understand correctly. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. But you see, the time came he had to exercise his own authority. Right. Right. Amen. 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 We tried to do it, but we couldn't do it. We'd done it for 15 years. And you know, that's what happens with Christians. They just think, well, they've been praying for me. They'll still pray for me. Sure, they'll pray for you. And they could do it and carry you when you was a baby, but you're going to have to know what belongs to you. You're going to have to realize that you're sitting there too at the right hand of the Father. That's the right hand. That's the place of authority, isn't it? Amen. Ever believer, ever believer. Amen. Amen. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Now notice it doesn't say he's a roaring lion. It said as a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour, but you can do something about it. Whom resist steadfast in your faith. So Jesus James and Peter tells a believer to do something about the devil. Now let's see what Paul said. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians again. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27. Neither give place to the devil. Now what does that mean? Don't give the devil any place in you. Well, now you'd have to have authority over him to keep him from it, wouldn't you? In other words, that's what it's saying. Neither give place to the devil or don't give the devil any place in you. He said that to believers. Then every believer has the authority over the devil then. Amen. Otherwise, you couldn't keep him from taking a place. If you give place to the devil, listen to me real carefully. If you give place to the devil, there's nothing that Jesus can do. 
I want to repeat that. It's so important. If you give place to the devil, there's nothing that Jesus can do because you have the authority, not him. He had it and got it through his death, burial, and resurrection, but he gave it to you. You're seated at the right hand of the Father. There's nothing Jesus can do. You have the authority and you have given the devil permission to take a place in you. Nothing Jesus can do about it. Can you see that? Unless you do something against the devil, Jesus still can't do anything about it. In that vision, Jesus said to me, let's go back to that minute. He said to me, I've done and heaven has done, Father God, heaven has done, all they're ever going to do about the devil until that angel comes down from heaven and binds him, puts him to the bottomless pit. See, he's not going to do anything nowadays about the devil. Are you listening? You see, he said he arose and had delegated the authority over the devil to the church. The believers have been delivered. They're not going to get delivered. They have been delivered. Isn't that terrible? You know, most Christians are running around trying to get something the Bible said is already theirs. Why don't you wake up and start walking in the light? Amen. Amen. Now notice Colossians 1.13. Who hath delivered us, not who's going to deliver us, in the sweet by and by, sometime after a while, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, now that can also be translated who's delivered us from the authority of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Well, if I've been delivered from the power, the authority of darkness, then darkness, and in that word darkness is everything that Satan is. Amen. Then darkness, Satan, his kingdom has no authority over me. Amen. 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 I said amen. Amen. I'm translated, delivered from his authority, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. You see, heaven isn't going to do anything about the devil. Now, you are because you've been delivered. So we certainly had better wake up, hadn't we? Change our praying. Get after the devil. We have the authority to do it. Now why? We are sitting. We are sitting at the right hand of the Father far above. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, those are two good words to shout about, aren't they? Amen. Did you ever shout about far above? <laughs> far above. Far above what? All dominion and power. Glory to God principalities. Amen. That's where we are. Amen. Take her place. If we're above these principalities in power, then we have authority over them. Yeah. Now notice the scripture goes on to say, Ephesians 1, go back to there now, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. The feet are members of the body. Amen. Feet aren't members of the head. Amen. See, he's the head, we're the body. Now look at the 23rd verse, which is his body. Let's read that 22nd verse, then go on again. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Which is his body. Amen. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. How wonderful it is. Amen. Glory to God Amen. to know that the least members of the body of Christ, those who are the very soles of the feet, are far above. Amen. Far above. Amen. Far above. Amen. All the mighty sources that we've been considering all the principalities and powers. No wonder that Jesus said, remember, I said, even those members that are the soles of the feet are far above. 
No wonder Jesus said there in Luke 10, 19. Go back there now. Behold, I give unto you power or authority to tread on serpents. That means walk on them. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. And scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. See, he's using scorpions and serpents symbolically as being demons and evil spirits because he said, and over all the power of the enemy, didn't he? I give you authority to tread on them. The church has the authority to tread on them. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. 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 See, the enemy has been too long walking on us. Amen. See, generally speaking, in the church world, even among Pentecostal people, you'd think that the devil's bigger than everybody and anybody, that he's running everything. Now, we know he's the God of this world. 2 Corinthians 4, 4, Paul said he's the God of this world. But though we're in the world, we're not of the world. Amen. And he doesn't have any right to tread over us or rule us or dominate us. In fact, he can't unless you let him. Because these scriptures we just got through reading that was given to the church, neither give place to the devil. That means you can keep him from taking place in you. That means you've got the authority. That means you've got the power. That means you've got the ability to do it. God's not unjust. If he asked you to do something you couldn't do, he'd be unjust. But he's not unjust. Paul states it plainly in Romans 5, 17. Did you, I'm talking about exercising the authority of this hour. Did you wear your shouting clothes tonight? Amen. Now look at Romans 5, 17. I'm going to read King James translation first. For if by one man's offense, that's Adam's sin, Death reigned. He's talking about spiritual death reigning. By one, much more, they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign. R-E-I-G-N. Reign in life. Reign in the next life. No, in life, this life. By one, Jesus Christ. Now notice the Amplified New Testament says, shall reign as kings. Yeah. Glory to God. I mean, that, that's either so or not so, isn't it? That's either the truth or a lie. I believe it's the truth. Shall reign as kings in life. In life. Reign as kings. Woo! Glory to God. Who is it? They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness. That's us. That's us. Shall reign as kings in life through the one Jesus Christ. But when I first came up from, from the Baptists over among the Pentecostals, they used to sing a song, and, and the part of it went once, said, Here I wander like a beggar through the heat and the cold. That don't sound like raining, does it? So many of our songs were embalmed with unbelief. I'd rather hear a donkey bray at midnight in a tin bar. But people, people believe the song they sing sometimes more than they do the, what the Bible said about it. We've sung some of those songs along till we believe they're true. They'd sing, Here I wander like a beggar through the heat and the cold. People shed a few tears about wandering like a beggar. Thought God was a blessing him. But God's plan is not for you to wander like a beggar through the heat and the cold. God's plan is for you to rule and to reign in your life. What do you mean to rule and to reign in your life? Well, everything just concerns your life. God's plan is for you to reign, to rule over circumstances to rule, to reign over poverty, yes. to rule, to reign over disease, yes. to rule and to reign over everything else that would hinder you. Yes. Glory, to God. Glory, to God. Glory, to God. glory to God. I said glory to God. I said glory to God. I'll tell you, if you really believe that, we'd be shouting so they'd hear us all the way down to town Townsville. Praise God. Now, notice 
notice the expression amplified, shall reign as kings. Now, what do you mean reign as king? Why and how does that king reign? Because he has the authority to do it. Well, you reign because you have authority. You reign by Christ Jesus. I tell you, sometimes people in the church act like young mockingbirds. You don't ever got their eyes open yet. Mama comes along to feed them anything, just, just open them out and just poke anything in the world out. Well, shut your mouth, bless God, and get into the Word. Don't let people just poke anything in the world out. Are you listening to me? Amen. 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 And then just poke anything in the world down them and they'll believe it. They think, you know, well, we're supposed to be humble and so therefore we're not supposed to have anything. But that hadn't got a thing in the world with being humble. Are you listening to me? I remember a preacher, I remember several years ago, back, back in the 50s, one minister told me about another preacher, said he's very humble. I tell you, he's one of the most humble men I've ever met said he drives a 1936 Chevrolet, 20-year-old car. I said, that's not being humble, that's being ignorant. <laughs> but now that's, that's that preacher's idea of what being humble is. That was that preacher's idea of humility. One fellow said, you know, Jesus and the apostles never drove a Cadillac. Of course not, they didn't have any there. <laughs> but he did ride a donkey. And that was the Cadillac of that day. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It was the best means of transportation they had. Is either that or walk. That's better, isn't it? To ride than to walk. See, sometimes people let the devil cheat them out of the blessings that they could have. When God never intended, does not, did not, does not, it's not in his plan, intend that we should be poverty stricken. Amen. 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 He said that we're to reign in life. Reign as amplified, said by, as kings Amen. in life. He didn't intend that the devil should dominate us. He doesn't intend that the devil should dominate any member of the body, his body. Amen. Amen. I'll tell you, we ought to get stirred up about it, bless God. Amen. Just tell the devil, take his hand off of us. Amen. And off of our finances. And off of our children. Amen. We've got a right to exercise authority as long as those children are smaller. That's the reason I exercise that authority. For 15 years, it worked 15 solid years. Amen. Amen. Then he picked up on it and began to use the same authority. Amen. Amen. Thank God for his word. I said, thank God for his word. Amen. Thank God for his word. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got a right just to tell the devil to stop whatever he's doing right now. Amen. Now, sometimes some of we folks, you know, that know more in the word and have grown because we had the right teaching, we'll have to help temporarily, just like we carried Ken on our faith for 15 years. I remember when my wife and I first married. Well, I'd just come out of the Baptist just a year before, really, got the baptism of the Holy Ghost, spoke in the other tongues just a year before. And I'm past this little Pentecostal church. And, and, and so we were married. We'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary this month. Day's, day's the first day of November, November the 25th. We will have been married 50 years. Well, now, I was a Baptist background. She was of a Methodist background. And so we married 25th day of November, 1938. And then in December, you know, one of the first real cold, we'd had some cool spells, but a real cold, we call them down in Texas, uh, one of those blue northers came in. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And, and, and so old Rita said, uh, and I didn't know this before, she said she got a sore throat. She said, when the first real cold spell comes, my throat gets sore and it's sore all the winter. All the winter, chronic thing, just sore all the winter. I'll have to go to the doctor tomorrow. Now, I remember 1938, we didn't have all the so-called miracle drugs you got today. They, they, they'd mop your throat out or swab it out, you know, with something. 
I'll have to go to the doctor tomorrow and have my throat swabbed out. They started to take out the tonsils a time or two, but some reason or other they didn't. Well, now, I know, you see, that, that she doesn't know because she hasn't been trained in this. She hasn't heard. And so I know that I can care her. I can exercise authority. Besides, that's my household anyway. So I just simply said, no, we won't go to the doctor tomorrow and have your throat swabbed out or mopped out. <laughs> that will leave you and will never come back. Well, that was 50 years ago. It left her and has never come back. I'm talking about that chronic. I don't mean she hadn't had a sore throat, but not that chronic. And she still got her tonsils. And incidentally, she'll be 70 tomorrow. <laughs> amen. Amen. I said amen. amen. I'll tell you the truth about it. Most all of us got more authority than what we recognize, what, than what we are using, what we recognize. And that's the reason we do not not use it because we didn't recognize it's ours. Amen. amen. I said amen. amen. I said amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We must learn to be exalted to the place where God wants us. Notice what he said. Look at it again. He has raised us up together and he's exalted us. I'm not talking about, oh, he exalted Christ. He exalted us too. Hold your place right there on Ephesians 2. Amen. Turn right on over here to Philippians. And you see, he's preaching the same thing. Now notice the ninth verse of the second chapter of Philippians. Wherefore God also has highly exalted him. Now, when did he exalt him? When he raised him from the dead. And when he ascended on high and sat down and given him a name above all names, and see that name belongs to us. Now, go back now with that thought in mind, go back to that sixth verse, and has raised us up together and made us sit together. Hallelujah. hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. We must learn to be exalted to the place where God wants us. Amen. We didn't exalt ourselves. We're not trying to exalt ourselves. We're just taking advantage of what belongs to us. Amen. 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 The church fails too often in her ministry of authority and is bowed down in defeat and is overcome with fear. But it shouldn't be that way. Not with any believer. Go back to Ephesians 1.22 again real quickly. And it put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Well, now he's head. He proved that when he was here on earth. He's head over sickness and disease, isn't he? I said, isn't he? He's head over any evil. Now, this reversed the words in order to bring out more clearly the deepest significance of what God said. Notice, head to the church over all things. He is being head over all things is for the church's sake. He didn't need to be head over all things for God's sake. He didn't need to be head over all things for his own sake, but it's for the church's sake. We need to set reverently before these mighty truths and with their tremendous meaning until our hearts grasp what God's saying to us. Hallelujah. Once our spirits get a revelation of what God's saying, we'll reap rich rewards. We'll know and see the true meaning of God's revelation. God has made Christ to be the head over all things to the church. It's for our sake that he's the head so that we through him might exercise that authority over all things. Amen. Can you see that? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When we see what belongs to us, 
then we'll enjoy the victory that he has for us. Now, I, I think that there's no message in all of the New Testament that the devil fights any harder than this one. He'll fight to keep us from getting there. But through stubborn faith in Christ, the victory can be ours now. Amen. Whoa, glory to God. I don't know whether you've, I've helped you or not, but a priest be happy. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It wouldn't take much for me to have a East Texas brush arbor spell. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we've been first night talking about the authority that's ours, tonight talking about exercising this authority. Well, we've got one more night. I don't know whether I'll get through everything or not, but we're going to talk about risen with Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Raise, look at that second verse. Stand up, everybody. Stand up. Open your Bibles to that sixth verse of the second chapter of Ephesians. This is God, the Holy Ghost, through the apostle Paul writing to the church, to us, and has raised us up together. I'm risen with Christ and made us sit together with Christ in heavenly places. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Amen. 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 Somebody asked somebody, what are you doing these days? Well, I said, I'm just hanging around the cross. They ought to be sitting on the throne. Amen. Sure, we come by the cross. Thank God for the cross. But that's not all of it. That's just part of it. Amen. Come on by the cross over to Pentecost. Some folks came that far. Got filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. And they've been right there at the door ever since then. Come on up and sit down. 